Hi, my name is Ashley and I'm a mom of two little girls. I have a four-year-old named Kylie and I also have a two-year-old named Mia. So last week I did a part one Q&A and I got an overwhelming yes response on doing a part two for the Q&A. So here we are, that is today's video. So in the part one Q and A, I answered about 20 questions and I would like to answer at least another 20 because I literally received hundreds of them and I tried to go through and pick out as many different kinds of questions as possible to cover a really wide range of topics. There was a ton of overlap and a lot of questions that were actually touched on in videos that I've already done. As I mentioned last week, things related to special needs and toilet learning and independent sleep and independent play and uh, getting your friends and family on board with Montessori, like all all those kinds of things I have already talked about in previous videos in a lot of detail. So I will go ahead and again, pop links to all of those videos in the description box down below so that if your question in particular was not answered and it was related to one of those topics, you can go watch one of those videos and hopefully get your answer there. So the first question is from Amelia Lynette. Advice for picky eaters. Do your girls have foods that they don't like and do you work around that? So yes, my girls do have foods that they don't like. I'm not sure that I necessarily would classify them as picky eaters because they eat a good amount of the things that we serve at home, but there are definitely things that are on their no-go list that they will not touch with the 10 foot pole. But here's how we deal with it in our home. So we typically don't have too many problems with breakfast and lunch because those two meals are more like the girls get to choose what they want. We aren't all necessarily always having the same thing. And you know, I don't normally serve vegetables and things that they don't like at breakfast usually. So it's usually not much of a problem with breakfast. Lunch, same thing. We kind of just go through our pantry in our fridge, look for leftovers, maybe kind of pull together from ingredients that we have, and it's not really that big of a deal. Dinner time is typically where we tend to have a little bit of issues sometimes with the girls expressing their opinions about what they don't want. And it's typically because that's where I always make sure I incorporate healthy options, vegetables, the whole nine yards. And I will say this, I am not a short order cook. That has always been my rule from day one. So whatever we are cooking together as a family for dinner is what I expect the girls to eat in some form or another. Sometimes Mike and I like to eat spicy food. And so on nights like that, I will actually like pull out a little portion of the food before I add whatever it is that's spicy so that they have something that they can can eat and then we eat the dish just the way it's normally planned to be eaten. But again, I'm not a short order cook, so whatever I'm cooking for the family for dinner that night is what everybody is expected to eat. But here are my views on that. It is our job as parents to provide healthy options for our children and to make sure that they are eating at appropriate times, like making sure that they have the three square meals or whatever your family's normal schedule is. But once I have put those things in front of them, it is up to them to decide what they're going to eat off of their plate and how much they're going to eat. So if I happen to serve something that the girls don't like, then they know already ahead of time that the expectation is there are not going to be any other snacks or any other substitute meals. Now I do try to include like at least one element of the meal that I know that they're going to eat. This way, if they choose not to eat the questionable things, they're not going to bed 100% hungry, but there have definitely been some really tough moments, if we're being honest, where Kylie just flat out was like, I'm not eating anything. And that was the end of it. She went to bed hungry that night and you know what? She didn't starve. She did wake up a little extra hungry for breakfast the next morning, but you know, she was okay at the end of the day. And you know, those moments are few and far between. I would say they don't really happen at all anymore. I'm noticing that as she's getting older, her pickiness level is not quite as bad. Like it was, it really reached a peak between the age of like three and four, I would say. And now, like I said, she's almost four and a half and it's starting to wane a little bit. But I'm curious to see if Mia goes through the same thing because right now she's actually a pretty good eater, I would say. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even say that she has too many preferences but you know, we'll see. So again, bottom line is that we put the healthy options in front of them, but it's up to them to choose what and how much they're going to eat. And that's the end of the story. Next question is from Emily Thielman. It says, hi, my two and a half year old loves to climb out of his crib now. Any tips to prevent this? So in the Montessori approach, we advocate for using a floor bed as opposed to a crib for a whole variety of reasons. And one of them being freedom. The child, especially toddlers, they crave that independence and freedom to be able 
able to get in and out of their bed at will. And trying to prevent a toddler from doing that in a crib is going to be pretty difficult because they climb really well by two and a half years old. And that poses a really big safety risk. You know, there are lots of kids who fall out of their cribs and like break arms and legs and stuff. So I would say if you're comfortable with it, the first step you can take to maybe moving him to a Montessori style floor bed or a big kid bed, however you wanna call it, is to just take his mattress out of the crib and put it directly on the floor. You don't have to go out and buy a big expensive fancy floor bed right off the bat. You can just kind of test the waters by having the mattress on the floor and removing the crib from his room entirely. Another option you can try is to, I know I don't know if your crib works like this, but I know some of them do, and if yours does, it might be worth a try. Sometimes that front um, railing comes off and it converts into like a small toddler bed. So you could try that as well if that's an option for you. But I would definitely give him the independence that he's very clearly showing you he needs and give him the ability to get in and out of his bed at will. Next question is from Life with Ruse. It says, when can we buy your book? I am so excited to share this information with you guys. When when I am officially allowed to do so, but I haven't been given any official like launch dates yet from the publisher. So when I can, I will. I think the most that I know and can tell you right now is that the book will be officially available for sale like everywhere starting in January of this coming year. But I do know that it's gonna go up for pre-order probably in the fourth quarter of this year. So there'll be a whole like pre-order period before it's like in stores and stuff. So I'm super excited and I will tell you guys as soon as I know. Another super quick question from Anima Plina. Can you share that kid's cooking book name that you talked about a while ago? Sure. I'm pretty sure the one that you're talking about is called Cooking Class. She loves that book. We have tried so many of the recipes in there. They are incredibly kid-friendly, very easy to follow along with. And now that Mia is starting to become a little more independent in the kitchen as well, when she's excited and wants to try something, she goes and grabs the cookbook now too. So I would highly recommend it. Next question is from Welcome to the Willow Bees. Is there any reason you're waiting to send Mia to Montessori school next year. So the way that their birthdays are, Mia will officially be turning three. So she is technically like eligible to go to Montessori school in March when her birthday is, but that's literally like in the middle to ending of this school year. And I have to wait until fall to enroll her. So she'll be like three and a half by the time I actually send her to school, which is fine. Ideally, I would have liked to send her sooner, but you know, it's the way the school system works with like birthdays and cutoff dates and stuff. Honestly, I've always wanted to have my babies at home with me up until the preschool year. Like that was always a dream of mine before I ever started doing YouTube. And it wasn't something that I thought I was gonna be able to do until I started doing this and it gave me the opportunity to be able to stay home with them. So I'm choosing to keep me at home until she is able to go to preschool next year. Another question about Montessori schools from A. Colip Martinez. Are all Montessori preschools alike or do you have to be careful in choosing one? I have actually done an entire video on this and I'll be sure to put that in the little list of videos in the description box down below for you if you wanna watch it. But the short answer to this question is no, they are not all created equal. So the thing is, Montessori, that name, it's not officially like trademarked or anything. So any school can use the word Montessori in their title or they can tell you that they implement a Montessori curriculum and it can actually not be authentic Montessori at all, which is really sad in a way because it really makes it difficult for us as parents to kind of, you know, sift through the pile of options and figure out what is good and what is not so good. But in that video, I give you all of the things to look for to kind of figure out whether or not the school that you're potentially considering is more closely aligned with traditional Montessori principles or if it's something that maybe isn't quite so much and is just using the Montessori name. So I would definitely recommend checking out that video when you have a chance because like I said, I go into a lot of detail on that. Next one is from Kels Nicole. How do you incorporate Santa at Christmas time with a Montessori approach? I think I actually addressed this question in a previous Q&A that I did like last year, but I just wanted to briefly touch on it here because it's a pretty simple answer, at least for the way we do it in our family. And I think this is the way a lot of Montessori families do it who choose to incorporate Santa because some families don't and that's okay too. But if you still want to incorporate Santa from a Montessori perspective, this is what our family does. And I think it works really well. It's a nice happy medium because I grew up with Santa and I wanted it to be part of our holidays. It always has been, but I wanted to also be respectful of my children and not lie to them. So what we've chosen 
chosen to do is actually explain to Kylie and Mia this year, because last year she was really too small to even understand the concept of Santa, I think. We explained up front that Santa is not real. He's a pretend fictitious character that people have made up and that they like to pretend does things like coming down the chimneys and bringing presents and riding in a sleigh with reindeer. Like we actually talk about it as this story that people kind of go along with for the holidays. And I think last year I actually watched a video on YouTube with Kylie about where um, Santa Claus actually came from. And honestly, I can't even remember the details anymore. So we'll probably watch it again this year because I think she would find it really interesting. But then after that conversation has had, we took a step back and said, okay, so that's the way it is. And you're gonna hear other people talking about Santa. Do you think we should play Santa in our family? Do we want to pretend that Santa is doing all of these things and kind of go along with it? And I left the decision up to the girls, honestly. Well, just Kylie last year, I left it up to her. And she said, yes, she was really excited about the idea of pretending about about Santa and stuff, but she will, can also articulate to you that it's not real. So I think that's a good happy medium. So like we still do Santa, she's not missing out on anything that maybe some of her peers are gonna be talking about when she's at school, but she knows the truth and ultimately we haven't lied to her about it. Next question is from Juliet Henry. How do you incorporate Montessori into days where you have lots of errands? My first inclination upon reading this question is, well, Montessori is our lifestyle. It's everything that we do from the moment the girls wake up until the moment that they go to bed. So for example, the girls sleep in a floor bed. They have their clothing down at their level in their rooms. They can dress themselves in the mornings and get ready for school or get ready for the day. They can brush their own teeth and kind of brush their own hair, you know, or they like to accessorize with little bows. They can do that all by themselves. Um, when we go downstairs for breakfast, they know how to serve themselves breakfast. If they're having like a little small bowl of cereal or some fruit or yogurt from the fridge, like they can do all of those things themselves. They pour their own milk. They know how to clean up after themselves. When it comes time for our playtime, they have a choice as to what the activities are that they like to do. I don't like over schedule with play dates and they don't have any like classes or lessons that they go to right now at this age. So it's, you know, very child led in that sense. But then on days when we have errands, which we don't always, but when we do, it's not really a big deal. It's not like Montessori is this like set aside time that we have and errands get in the way of or vice versa. I just incorporate the Montessori stuff into the errands. Like for example, the girls love to get themselves into their own car seats. In fact, Mia will fight me if I try to get her into the car seat, like if we're in a hurry. So I try to build in a little bit of extra time into our schedule to allow them to get themselves up into the car, which takes a while because it's kind of high off the ground and then up into their car seats. And Kylie even likes to buckle herself in. Mia has started trying to do that, but she's not very good at it yet. Or when we get to the store for the errand, if they want to sit in the cart, then I let them sit in the cart. But if they want to stop and get out and walk, I respect that. They stop and get out and walk. And then obviously it's a little bit of extra work for me to make sure that they're not wandering off, but that's okay. I try to respect them as much as possible. And so I guess what I'm getting at is that Montessori is woven into the fabric of our entire day. Everything we do has a slight Montessori perspective to it, if that makes sense. And so it doesn't really matter if we have a lot of errands or not, because it's mostly about providing opportunities for independence and and allowing them to have freedom within limits and then respecting my children more than anything. So yeah, I hope that makes sense the way that I described that just now. Next question is from TXNL Monty Mom. How do you prepare your child for a visit to the doctor, dentist, etc.? So I don't do anything super special or out of the ordinary. We do read books where the characters have dentist visits and doctor's visits. Kylie and Mia watch shows like Daniel Tiger where they have episodes where the characters go to the doctor and the dentist. So they have some familiarity from watching those and reading those kinds of books and whatnot. But beyond that, I do give them a heads up like at least a week in advance. I'll say, oh, did you guys know that you have a doctor's visit next week? Yeah, we've got to go to your four-year checkup or your two-year checkup. And I always say it with a very positive tone. There's never any negativity associated with it. And I will continue to do this leading up to the actual day of the visit. You know, I'll remind them like, oh, the day after tomorrow, we're going to that dentist appointment or tomorrow we have your doctor's appointment. And I just keep reminding them that it's coming so that they don't forget and like feel like it's been sprung on them. Now, when they were littler, they did not ask any questions about what was actually 
actually going to happen at the visit. But now that they are a little older and Kylie remembers going to doctor's appointments and now Mia is starting to enter that territory too, they do kind of have an idea of what might happen. And Kylie will ask me flat out, am I going to have to get shots when I go? And I am always, always, always honest with her. And they're always super cooperative for that first part of the checkup where they're just, you know, like checking their heartbeat and their vitals and all that stuff, height, weight, the whole nine yards. I think she actually thinks it's kind of fun because she always practices playing doctor at home too. But when it comes time for the end of the visit, especially on ones where she has to receive any kind of shots or anything, I don't lie to her. I tell her, you know, you're getting two shots today. And so she knows what to expect when we go in there. And I can always tell she gets a little bit more nervous. Mia does too at the very end because they know it's coming. But Kylie has always been super brave. Like it just boggles my mind that a child so young can have the strength that she does. I remember the first time that as a toddler, she had to get shots that I had my husband come with me because I was actually kind of worried going in there with a baby and a toddler for the possibility of like having screaming children. And I made Mike come with me and he had her sit on his lap for the shot. And he said to her, okay, Kylie, it's, you know, it's going to happen. Are you ready? And she's like, yeah. And then after they did it, Mike was like, are you okay? And she's like, it's all done, daddy. You don't have to worry. And just like jumped off his lap. And he was like, what? And I was equally shocked. I was sitting there with Mia. She was a tiny baby. And I'm like, no tears, really? And ever since that day, like she's never cried no matter what. Like she is fearless going into the doctor's office, completely confident in herself. And it makes me so proud. Like my mama heart is so proud for her every single time we go through that experience. Now Mia, on the other hand, definitely is a little bit more scared and she does cry when she gets her shots but even then I'm still super honest with her and I tell her the same kinds of things that I tell Kylie I think it's just a reflection of their difference in personalities so yeah that's what we do next question is from Jay Duganzik 88 anything on Montessori from birth what worked and what you want to try next time so I wasn't able to implement Montessori from birth with Kylie because she was already six months old by the time I came into it so we kind of did a little bit of backtracking and then worked our way forward from there but we were able to do Montessori from birth with Mia. And I will say that from that really early period, the first couple of months, some of my favorite memories are using the Montessori visual and tactile mobiles with her and actually having what I kind of put together as like a semi infant movement area for her where she just had like a little mat to lay on and then she had the mobile suspended above it and like a little shelf of toys nearby. And there was a mirror right next to the wall there as well where she could see herself. And I thought that that was a fantastic setup. Like she was such a happy, content baby to just sit there and like engage with her mobiles visually when she was really little. And then the tactile ones with the, you know, the ring on an elastic cord and whatnot. Like she had so much fun hanging out in that little area. And that's something that I will definitely do again with the next one. The one thing that I did not use with Mia that I definitely want to make sure I use the next time around is a Toppenchino, which is a like a Montessori baby pillow, basically. It's just like a little bit bigger than the size of your actual baby. And then it's like made of this thin, you know, cotton soft material, very thin padding. And it's just something that you use to kind of cradle your baby or they can lay down on it or use it for tummy time or whatever, but it goes with them kind of wherever they go. And so it has this familiar scent of the people who are holding them, their family members and of their home environment. And it's kind of like a, a reference point, a touch point for your baby, just to give them a little bit of extra security and comfort. And it also helps with when you're like trying to transfer them to another surface while they're sleeping. You know, it, you guys know, as soon as a, ba a sleeping baby hits a cold surface after being held for a while, they like instantly wake up. And supposedly, again, I haven't tried this out for myself yet, but supposedly a tappuccino kind of helps with that because, you know, they're warm and snug on their tappuccino and it's still underneath them when you're moving them to another surface. I'm not recommending doing that for nighttime because that would definitely pose a SIDS risk, but at least for like nap times and stuff during the day when you're supervising them, it would be nice to be able to not risk them waking up. So I kind of want to try that. Next up is a question from Nat VNSA. Do your daughters ever ask for toys at the store? How do I approach this situation? Um, yeah, they do ask for toys. Not so much Mia, Kylie more so now that she's getting a little bit older, she's kind of learned that like these are things we can buy and take home with us. And so sometimes she'll see something that she kind of has her eye on and she'll drop subtle hints. She never just like flat out asks me. I think it's actually kind of funny. She'll just be like, ooh, this is really nice, mommy. <laughs> like try to get me to like figure out that she's subtly asking for it, which is hilarious. But 
Um, I am very upfront with them when we're at the store. Like if we're not there to buy something for them, then I tell them that, you know, there's no beating around the bush. I just say, we're not here to buy that today. We're here to get X, Y, Z. And then we just continue on with our trip. And fortunately, at least up to this point in time, the girls have never really given me much of a hard time about it. But I would like to think that it is because of the approach that we've used. Some other things that we've done that I think are helpful are first giving them a heads up ahead of time, especially if I know I'm gonna go to a store where there could be lots of toys, <laughs> Target. <laughs> so if that is going to happen, then I will kind of let them know ahead of time what the plan is. So for example, very recently, we went birthday present shopping for their little friend's third birthday. And so we had to go into the toy aisle and I knew they were gonna see things that they wanted. And so I gave them a respectful heads up ahead of time. I said, listen, we're gonna go to Target. We have to go pick up a toy for your friend for her birthday. I would love it if you helped me to pick something out that you think she would like. You might see some things there that you want for yourself, but I need you to remember that we're not shopping for you today. We're shopping for your friend today. It's her turn. And for the most part, that actually seemed to resonate with them really well and they were totally okay. We didn't have any issues. But something else we've also done in the past, and this can also help in any situation really, is to have this wish list either going on your phone or like in a little notebook or something like that that you kind of keep on you when you're out in the store. And anytime they say, oh, I really want this, instead of just saying, no, we're not getting it, you know, which for some kids can set them off, what you can do instead is take out this little wish list. Like I, for me, it's just on my phone in my notes app. I say, oh yeah, that looks really fun and exciting. Do you think we should add that to your wish list for your birthday? Or should we add that to your Christmas wish list, depending on which holiday is coming up first? And if they say, yeah, 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 then I'll take out my phone and, or if you're using a notebook, you would take out your notebook and I type it in right there in front of them so they can see that I'm writing it down. And usually that's more than enough to satisfy their desire for that thing in that moment because they've seen that I've added it to the wish list and they know that it could be forthcoming for the future. It's not a promise that I'm going to buy it, it's just a wish list, okay? But I have read time and time again that giving a child their wish in fantasy, putting it on a wish list and letting them imagine themselves getting it, it triggers the same areas of the brain that releases like all those feel good hormones and it makes them feel almost as good as if they actually got the thing in real life. And up to this point, I can say that that strategy does work. And the cool thing is, a lot of the times the kids, they just see something, you know, in passing that they're not really that excited about. They just are in the moment. And so you can add it to the wish list, avoid the issue altogether, and then they forget about it. And it's like, I go back a few weeks later or months later or whatever, and I delete it off the wish list. I'm like, that's not something that they really want. But then there are things that are on there that I'm like, oh yeah, I remember she was really excited about that. And it's a good idea for me for Christmas or for a birthday or whatever. But yeah, so that's what we do. And I think it seems to work. Next question is from Veronica J. Ramirez. What's the Montessori approach? to bottle weaning without using a sippy cup. So in the Montessori approach, there is actually no use of a sippy cup at all. They go straight from the bottle or breast right to a small open cup, like a little tiny glass that's their size that they can manage on their own. And you actually do this long before they are ever weaned, like when they're starting to eat solid foods at like six months old. So they're already accustomed to drinking from an open cup at that point. They can drink water, they can drink breast milk, they can drink formula, whatever you want, like as practice, just a small amount of it the first couple of months until they really get the hang of it and then from there it's just always from the cup you know they're once they wean from the breast then they're not breastfeeding anymore all of their liquids come from the cup if they're bottle feeding then you just don't offer the bottle anymore because they're at that point good enough to use a cup 100 of the time so there is no transition weaning there's no sippy cup or anything it's just from the bottle straight to the cup another one from paula may affordable floor bed and mattress combo please i love the sprout one but too much money so i can totally understand that and you do not have to have anything super fancy Honestly, you can literally just have a mattress on the floor. That is how Kylie had her floor bed set up for many months before we actually switched her over to something that was more like a floor bed. So if you're okay with having the mattress on the floor and just propping it up every so often to vacuum underneath, make sure there's no mold growth or anything like that, which by the way, I've never had an issue with, but we also live in a dry climate. So if you live in a more humid climate, it could be an issue. So just make sure to check under there periodically, prop it up, let the mattress air out while you're washing 
sheets each week, things like that. But yeah, you can have a mattress just directly on the floor. There is nothing wrong with that. Um, if you are looking for something that has sides on it to help contain your child a little bit, because the issue I ran into is that my daughter was a roller, very active sleeper, would constantly roll out of her bed every single night. Second daughter didn't do that, but my first one did. And so we had to come up with some kind of a solution to help keep her in the bed because she would literally wake up every single night. She did not go back to sleep ever. And that was unfortunate. My second daughter did. She was like a totally different child when it came to sleeping. But yeah, so what we ended up doing was buying the Ikea Cora bed, which is actually meant to be used like as a bunk bed if you want it to, or you can use it in the bottom configuration. So it's like a reversible bed. So we used it in the bottom configuration but instead of having it elevated like a, you know like a normal bed off the floor what we did was we took the slats out entirely well we didn't install them and we just put the mattress on the floor so that it was basically encased by like the box on the bottom and there was still this little cutout where the ladder goes so that she could crawl in and out independently by herself so it was basically like a hacked together floor bed situation if you will and that worked beautifully so she was able to get in out of the bed by herself but yet she wasn't rolling out of the bed because we had the sides there and it was perfect and i think the ikea core bed right now is like 179 dollars which is not super cheap but it's also not super expensive either i feel like it's a really good compromise if you're looking to just be able to go out and like buy something to use as a setup and if you happen to be crafty with wood or you know someone who is i have also seen a lot of really beautiful homemade like little floor beds to just to go around the mattress and help to elevate it off the floor just a little bit like just a couple inches i've seen a lot of really gorgeous homemade ones so that's something that you could also pursue that would probably be a lot cheaper than anything that you could purchase. Next up is a question from Dr. Molly Hossaman. If we are homeschooling, can we invest on Montessori materials? Yes, if you are a homeschooler and you want to do it the Montessori way and you have a budget for buying some of the authentic Montessori materials, I would absolutely say yes, go ahead and do that. You don't need every single material. Like that would break your bank and probably be a really big waste of money too because your child is not gonna be using one specific material for a super long time. Like there might be a couple, like the movable alphabet, they'd be using that for a while. But there are some materials that are only used for like a very short period of time in their education. And honestly, like it's okay to skip it probably. And I also think it's highly dependent on how long you're planning to homeschool. So for example, if you're only homeschooling because of the pandemic, or if you're only homeschooling for preschool, but then after that, they're going off to do an actual Montessori school or a traditional school even, then I think that's really going to affect which materials you want to invest in because you're not doing it for the long term. And so you might not need as many things and you definitely don't need everything in that situation. So it really depends on your personal circumstances. Next question is from Cherie MM. My daughter is 18 months and loves throwing her food. Any tips to redirect? Sure, so at 18 months old, your daughter is definitely capable of understanding that there are limits around meal time and that she should not be throwing her food. And so at this point, it's probably less Less about experimentation like it would be for a baby and more so about limit testing which is very natural for toddlers so she's not doing it to make you angry but she is trying to see if there is a limit that you're going to put in place like how often can she do this without you stopping her you know what are the limits she's asking you very clearly with her behavior and Something to consider is the fact that babies and toddlers are very good at listening to their own bodies. They are usually done with their meals a lot sooner than we think they are. You know, like as adults, we like to sit and eat and savor our food and enjoy conversation. Like babies and toddlers don't do that. They just, they sit when they're hungry, they eat and then they're done. And sometimes that only takes like, depending on how old they are, like a couple of minutes, like five, 10 minutes at most, and then they're done. But usually we're still sitting there. And so once they're finished eating, they're they're not hungry anymore, then they start playing with their food. So as soon as she starts to throw food or drop it off the edge of the tray or whatever, you know, the table, wherever she's sitting, that's a pretty big red flag that she's done with her meal and she's not hungry. And so it's very easy to then come in and say, oh, it looks like you're throwing your food. When you throw your food, that tells me that you're all done and you're not hungry. Let's take your plate to the kitchen. And that's it. You clean up her plate and here, let me help you down from the chair. Let's go get cleaned up and you end the meal. And if she really is still hungry, then she'll stop and she'll go back to eating. But if she continues to do it, then it's just, you know, what toddlers do. And so you've got to put that limit in place 
consistently every single time until she understands that that is not allowed. And she will get that message as long as you're consistent with it. And I'm saying this from personal experience because I've been so consistent with it at this point that my four-year-old will actually tell my two-year-old the things that I used to say to her and that she hears me saying to my two-year-old as well. Like she doesn't play with her food very often, honestly, anymore. But you know, the few times that she does try to test a limit just to see if that limit still exists, my four-year-old is almost as quick as I am to be like, Mia, you're playing with your food. That means that you're not hungry anymore. Should we take your plate to the kitchen? Like she, she already knows and she will tell her. So I think it's really funny. So the consistency is key though. And you know, you've been filming for a long time when the fresh battery you started with is now almost dead. So I'm gonna change that real quick and then we will continue. Okay, next question is from a Cuban family. How is Kylie doing at school? But more important, how are you doing? I'm good, thank you for asking. Um, Kylie is also doing really well. She loves school. Every day she comes back home and she says she can't wait to go back the next day. And so I'm taking that as a really good sign that she really is enjoying herself. Last week, I told you guys that she was giving me like the daily report every single day when she would come home and she would detail for me like everything they did from the moment she got dropped off until when I picked her up. But for some reason this week, she has done a complete 180. Like she no longer wants to tell me. I, I'll ask her like, did you have a good day? And she'll say, yeah, I had a good day. And then I'm like, what did you do? And she'll be like, I don't want to talk about it right now. Like she's just kind of very like, you know, whatever, it doesn't really feel like sharing much information and I don't wanna press her too hard. I think maybe she's feeling like that because last week she was so forthcoming with the information that I was really excited about it and so I would ask her, you know, all kinds of little questions just to like figure out what she was talking about. And I don't know, maybe it was a little bit too much. I might've accidentally pushed her too hard. So I'm just trying to back off now and respect her space and let her tell me the things that she wants to tell me without asking her direct questions about it to hopefully take some of that pressure off. But yeah, she is definitely enjoying herself and I'm really happy for her. Next question is from Ita Logerman Life or Ita, maybe ITA Logerman Life, I don't know. But it just says twins, how? And I think this is a really interesting question because I don't have any experience working with twins, but I will share with you what I have read that I know of, and it's not very much, but maybe it's something to go off of. And it's that Montessori is actually really great for twins because your focus is on following the child and specifically the individual child and respecting our children for exactly who they are. And in this case, you know, twins tend to be very different from each other. And so we have to find it in ourselves to learn how to follow each of our children individually and go with their unique rhythms and refer to them separately by their names as opposed to just calling them the twins constantly, like helping to give them their own identity and Montessori is a really great way to do that because our whole focus is the child. Something else that can be really great about the Montessori approach, especially with respect to twins and really any siblings, is that we teach sharing by turn-taking. So instead of feeling this pressure to have two of everything so that there's not fighting or that they feel like I got one because he got one or vice versa, we don't do that. We just have one of everything and they learn how to navigate those social situations by learning how to take turns, you know? So if one of the children is playing with a toy, but the other one really wants it, then we can help them learn how to handle that by saying, oh, it looks like you really wanna play with that right now, but he's still playing with it and he's not done yet. It'll be available soon. And then they can learn how to find some other activity or you can help them to wait their turn if they're having a hard time with it. But they're learning all of these like little social things by having a sibling to interact with. And then again, also Montessori is huge on independence, so providing as many opportunities for your children to be independent as possible is going to take more pressure off of you as the parent because they can do more things for themselves. You don't have two constantly needing something from you. Maybe when they're babies, that's not so true, but as they grow into toddlers, it becomes more of this independence focus. So it's a win-win for everybody. The next one is from Relentlessly Awesomer. How do you handle family members, grandparents who totally disregard a Montessori parenting style, like over helping your child, pushing boundaries, like demanding hugs and kisses, using bribes for certain behavior, or giving constant presents that are not Montessori aligned? So I did a whole video on getting family and friends on board and gifting and dealing with some of these situations. And I will put a link to that video in the description box down below for sure, because I know that that's a really tough area for a lot of families and trying to figure out how to navigate. But just to give you like a little basic overview for this Q and A, the gist of it is that 
you cannot change other people's behavior. You can try to educate them. You can try to influence their behavior kind of subtly without being too pushy, but ultimately you can't change their behavior. So if they are open-minded to learning more about Montessori parenting, then you can drip them information like little by little, little videos, little articles, maybe suggest that they read a book or you know let them borrow one of your books if they're open to reading and listening and watching those kinds of things to help them learn more about it. Because a lot of resistance comes from a lack of knowledge at, at first at least. And so if you can kind of help get them to understand where you're coming from, then that can be a really great opening point for them being a little bit more willing to go along with the way it is that you want to raise your children. But inevitably, sometimes there are going to be people who are very resistant. They do not want to follow it. They feel like their way was perfectly fine the way they raised kids. And so why do they need to do it any differently? And you know, there's really not much that you can do when you have somebody like that in your life. And it's unfortunate because I know that sometimes these are the people that are caring for your child when you're gone at work or wherever you are for an extended period of time and it can be really frustrating to know that you don't really have much control over all those hours when you're not there. I totally feel you on that. But at the end of the day, what you have to remind yourself is these people love your child. You know, they care for them. They do want nothing but the best for them just like you. Maybe their approach is not exactly the way that you would want it to be, but like I said, at the end of the day, they love them. They're caring for them. They're making sure that they're safe. And you know, that's the most that you really can ask for is to know that your child is going to be okay when you come back to them at the end of the day. Oh, one other thing, I probably should have mentioned this. Modeling is also another really good thing that you can do. So during the times that you are there with your child and these other people, modeling the power of the Montessori approach for them to see it in action is sometimes more powerful than anything else that you can do because you can actually show them like, look, oh, he can put his shoes on all by himself or let's just give him a minute. He can get his jacket on by himself. Let them see your child helping you in the kitchen with food preparation. Give them examples in action of all the things that your child is capable of doing so that they can see that they don't need to help necessarily, if that makes sense. So do what you can to educate the people in your child's life that maybe aren't quite on board with it yet, but don't stress yourself out over it too much. The relationship between you and your child is going to be the most influential piece of, you know, their overall development as time goes on. And they may have outside influences that do things different ways, but children are also very resilient and they'll learn that grandma does it this way. And then when mommy's home, we do it another way. They, they pick up on things like that. And so just, you know, trust in your gut that what you're doing is what is best for your child when you are there and you have the ability to control it. The next question is from Lana Paredes. Can you expand on how you plan a transition or change your daily schedule now that Kylie's in school? I have a pre-K going to Montessori school full-time in September, and I'm at a loss as to how to implement our regular shelf activities because this person also has a one and a half year old. So should they transition more of the shelf geared toward her? So honestly, we haven't done a whole lot of changing in our schedule other than just the morning routine. Like before we were waking up and having breakfast and kind of going about our morning work cycle together. And I purposefully structured it that way because I wanted it to be similar to what Kylie was going to experience when she was at school and also similar to what we would be doing at home once Kylie was gone at school. And so it's not really that much different. We still get up together, we still have breakfast together. The only difference is that we now go drop Kylie off at school and then we come back and instead of having Kylie and Mia and me during our work cycle where they're choosing their own activities, now it's just Mia and I and she's you know directing her own work and choosing her own activities without any outside influence from her sister, which is actually a really nice benefit because I feel like she's coming into her own now. So we still have our morning work cycle right up until lunchtime basically when I have to go get Kylie just like we did before. And then we go get Kylie, we come home, we have lunch. And then from there, our schedule looks exactly the same. When she comes home from school, it depends what day of the week it is. Well, first we always have quiet time in the afternoons. We have lunch and then quiet time. And then on Mondays, we go to the park. On Tuesdays, we just kind of stay home and do our own thing around home. Wednesday, we go to the library. And then on Thursday and Friday, again, it's just kind of like a stay at home, do our own thing. Or if we have like an errand to run or something, that's the time of the day that we would do that. And then we transition into dinner and bedtime. 
So it's really honestly not that much different than before. But with regard to your question about the shelf, yeah, if your child is gonna be gone for a full day, a majority of the week and, and then a half day for the rest of the week, it sounds like the playroom or your play space, whatever it, it looks like, needs to be set up with a little bit more thought toward your younger child because they are gonna be spending more time in that space than your older child is. And so yeah, you could maybe set up the shelf if you have like a specific shelf for just the like the Montessori style activities, then yeah, I would definitely gear more of those toward your younger child. But then definitely still make sure to keep some things out for your older child, like open-ended materials, arts and crafts materials, blocks, magnet tiles, trains, cars, dolls, you know, all those kinds of like classic childhood things. Those are the kinds of things that your preschooler may actually want to engage with more because it's less about what they're doing at school. You know, it's more room for like just open-ended thought flow, creativity, whatever. And it might be a good way for them to relax at the end of the day, honestly, after school. So yeah, I'd focus more on open-ended stuff for the older child and arts and crafts stuff. And then, you know, kind of really focus your Montessori style activities that you have out on the shelf, more so for the younger one. I think that's a good idea. Next up is a question from Philippa Pay. I'm interested in what you find stimulating and soundly responsible for screen time. I actually had a lot of people ask me about this in a variety of different questions on both Instagram and YouTube. So I've talked about this in a video before, like the kinds of shows that Kylie and now Mia watch together. And I don't think it really has changed much. I will put a link to that video in the description box down below if you wanna watch it, cause it's got more detail on kind of like how I set up screen time for them too. But if you're just wondering about like the shows that they watch, I only allow them access to certain shows. They are never given an iPad with free reign of YouTube. I don't even really let them watch YouTube, not even YouTube kids, because I found a lot of like really weird, like sing song nursery rhyme videos popping up and stuff that I just was like this almost, it felt brainwashing to me and I didn't like it at all. But yeah, as far as the actual TV shows that the girls watch, and it's primarily Kylie, but Mia has started kind of like watching with her at times, but then I find that she'll like get bored and wander off. So she won't actually sit and watch for as long as Kylie does. But um, the ones that she's primarily into right now are from the Disney Channel. The only one that she watches is Doc McStuffins. And then she also loves Wild Kratts, which I think is fantastic because it's a really educational show. She lear learns all kinds of stuff about animals. And I'm like, where did you learn that? And she's like, oh, Wild Kratts, uh. And I'm like, oh, okay. So Wild Kratts is another big favorite of hers, especially right now. But then she also has a whole bunch of shows that are on her Kindle Fire tablet that are primarily like the Amazon Prime shows. I don't know, it's like a mishmash of things. But the ones that she's always asking to watch periodically from time to time, it switches are Leo the Wildlife Ranger, um, I'm trying to remember them all, Stinky and Dirty, Tumble Leaf, which teaches like physics concepts, which I think is really cool. Like in each episode, there's like a different physics concept that's explored. Oh, also Creative Galaxy. She really likes that one and she's very into arts and crafts. So she goes through periods where she'll watch that for a long time. And then also the Kindle Fire has like old reruns of things like Dora the Explorer that she really likes watching. She's also watched Reading Rainbow a bunch of times and she loves that one. And also a couple of times I have pulled up the Magic School Bus for her on YouTube and she really likes those too. So I feel like there's a, probably a couple that I'm forgetting, but those are like the main ones. And the last question for today is from CD. Relationship advice. You and Mike have been together for a long time and it looks like the both of you still have a healthy relationship. How do you guys stay on the same page regarding your children? And if you have disagreements, do you try to argue in private or would you say that it's better to argue in front of your children so that they can see reality? Also, what is one memory that you and Mike share that is the most memorable or romantic? Yeah, Mike and I, I think, have a pretty healthy relationship. At least I'd like to think so. I'm pretty sure he does too. I feel like we're just very naturally on the same page. And for anything that we might not be potentially, I would say that I'm with the girls the majority of the time and I'm the parenting nerd. I'm constantly reading like parenting stuff and you know, like this is what I love to talk about. And so I will usually go to him with like, hey, there's this thing I read and I wanna share it with you. Or I'll say, you know, I kinda think I wanna do this with the girls. What do you think about this? And it's never in front of the girls that we do those kinds of things. It's usually like in the evenings after they've gone to bed. But I definitely think that it's more so me that's like, 
not making decisions. We make decisions together, but like I'm coming up with ideas of things that I want to try or things that I think maybe we should do if something's going on. Like I've, I'm the idea factory, but I always run things by him. And he has said to me time and again that he trusts my parenting advice. He knows that I have done my research a thousand and one times over. He trusts what I have to say. And I think that's really sweet, but there are times where he has ideas or he has questions and he thinks about things and he brings them to me too. So it's a two way street. We're definitely a team when it comes to our girls. And then as far as disagreements, we honestly, we I know this is, you guys are probably gonna think I'm lying. We hardly ever argue. That is something that Mike and I have always prided ourselves on. We don't never argue, but like our arguing is incredibly rare. And usually when we argue, it's about something like super stupid and petty that we're like, why are we even arguing about this? So when we do get into little tiny tiffs and disagreements over random things like that, sometimes it does happen in front of the girls. But if it's ever something that's like super sensitive and we can tell that the other one is starting to get a little bit heated, we'll stop and we talk about it or we argue about it, whatever needs to happen at a later time when we're not in front of the girls. Like we do not get into heated arguments in front of the girls ever. And I particularly am really sensitive to that because Mike didn't have much experience with that when he was growing up. He says he remembers like one time that his parents ever really got mad at each other in front of him and his sister. But for me, things were very different. Like my parents were always arguing from as early as I can remember. Like some of my earliest memories from when I was two were of my parents arguing. And I always knew in my heart when I was older that I didn't want that for my own children because I remember how stressed out it made me feel as a child, even though I had nothing to do with what was going on. And so it got really bad, like to the point that when I was like 14 or 15, no, I was driving. So I was 16. Um, I actually took, I had a four year old sister at the time. She was Kylie's age. I took her in my car and I took her to a friend's house just to get her out of the situation because I didn't want her to have to go through it because I knew how it felt. And I just, I felt for her even at 16. And so I was very relieved to say the least when my parents finally got a divorce when I was like 16 or 17. And so the point of that is I make a point of it to not let that happen in front of our girls because I don't ever want to put them in that kind of an emotional situation. So petty disagreements, yes, so that they can see conflict resolution and they can see that we have differing opinions and how to solve that in a you know, respectful way, but anything that could be a little more sensitive or heated, not in front of them. And then one memory that we share that is most memorable or romantic, um, there's a lot of them, honestly. We've had we've been together for a really long time, but just the first one that popped into my head just now when I read that question is on our honeymoon, we went to Hawaii, we stayed on Maui for a week and we went surfing, like we but we met surfing, like we love surfing, but we're not incredibly good at it. And we had never been surfing in Hawaii before. So we decided to actually go take like a formal surf lesson at one of the surf schools. And it was really fun. And I remember the instructor was like literally this 12 foot tall guy. Like I felt like a child standing next to him. I don't know how he was so big, but he was our instructor and he was super cool. And he suggested at some point in the, in the lesson that we get on a tandem surf surfboard and do like a tandem surf. And I was like, that's not going to work. There's no way that we're going to be able to do this. And we did, we got up and we surfed the whole way back into shore, the two of us on this like giant 10 foot longboard. And it was so incredibly fun. And they had people taking pictures. So we actually have a picture of it. Actually, I'll pop a picture up right here so you guys can see, but yeah, it was, it was incredibly fun. I always look back on that, that, that time in Hawaii very fondly. <sighs> okay. It is incredibly late. I am done answering questions for this Q and A. I sincerely hope that I got to as many kinds of questions as possible, that everybody feels like they got a little piece of something in answer to their question. Again, if you did not have yours answered, check out some of the videos down below and see if maybe one of those topics is related to your question. And then hopefully you can get some answers there, but 
don't worry, I'm sure I'll be doing another Q&A at some point in the future. So that is it for today. If you are interested in learning more about doing Montessori at home or positive discipline parenting, I offer a couple of e-courses that walk you through it step by step. So I'll be sure to leave a link to that in the description box down below as well. And just in case you are new to my channel, I also wanted to let you know that this video is part of a much larger series on this YouTube channel called Montessori at Home, which is aimed at providing practical tips and advice for busy parents like you and I for implementing Montessori at home with our children. So if that sounds like something that you're interested in watching more of, then you might consider subscribing to my channel. This way you don't miss a new video because I do upload a new one just like this one every single week. Thank you so much for watching today and I'll see you next time. Bye.